Grove family, we are in a season of astonishment, a season of stopping and noticing and wondering and reveling and practicing astonishment at the goodness of God. We believe in the power of God to change lives. That's one of our guiding principles here at the Grove. It's one of, our, one of the astonishing truths that we use to guide our decisions and form our community. We believe in the power of God to change lives. Here is a story about that. Now, there was a Pharisee, a man named Nicodemus, who was a member of the Jewish ruling council. He came to Jesus at night and said, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher who has come from God, for no one could perform the signs you are doing if God were not with him. Jesus replied, very truly, I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God unless they are born again. How can someone be born when they are old? Nicodemus asked. Surely they can't enter a second time into their mother's womb to be born. Jesus answered, very truly, I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God unless they are born by water and the spirit. Flesh gives birth to flesh, but spirit gives birth to spirit. You should not be surprised at my saying you must be born again. The wind blows wherever it pleases. You hear its sound, but you cannot tell where it comes from or where it is going. So it is with everyone born of the spirit. How can this be? Nicodemus asked. You are Israel's teacher, said Jesus, and you do not understand these things? Very truly, I tell you, we speak of what we know and we testify to what we have seen, but still you people do not accept our testimony. I have spoken to you of earthly things and you do not believe. How then will you believe if I speak of heavenly things? No one has ever gone into heaven except the one who came from heaven, the son of man. Just as Moses lifted up the snake in the wilderness, so the son of man must be lifted up so that everyone who believes may have eternal life in him. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe stands condemned already because they've not believed in the name of God's one and only son. This is the verdict. Light has come into the world, but people loved darkness instead of light because their deeds were evil. So everyone who does evil hates the light and will not come into the light for fear their deeds will be exposed. But whoever lives by the truth comes into the light so that it may be seen plainly that what they have done has been done in the sight of God. And here this promise from the letter Peter wrote to his community. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy, he has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Will you pray with me? God, we believe that we don't live by bread alone. Feed us your living word so that we might grow and be made new. In Jesus' holy name we pray. Amen. A man named Nicodemus came to Jesus and found Jesus at night. And the scripture tells us that he was a Pharisee. That means he was devout and committed to living righteously. It means his identity was born out of his faith in God. And he expressed his faith in hundreds of ways daily. The scripture says he was a leader, a member, a leader in the Jewish uh, council of elders, a member of the Sanhedrin. He was a Jerusalem insider. He had a position of power and privilege and honor and respect. And Jesus 
calls him rabbi, a teacher, and apparently an important one. Jesus says, you're a teacher of Israel. This man who came to Jesus, all that his culture said could be achieved, he had achieved. And yet, he comes to find Jesus at night. By day, he's mature and accomplished and wise and certain. But at night, things seem different to us in the middle of the night, don't they? All the uncomfortable, unsettled fears that we can push down and ignore and talk over in the bustle of daytime, they can't be contained at night. They can't be muted then. See, a lot of people think that Nicodemus came at night because he was too proud to come during the daytime. They think he came at night because he didn't want to be seen with Jesus, and that might be true. But I think he came at night because nighttime is when we can no longer escape the truth of our longings. Sometimes the middle of the night is the only time that we can hear our own soul. Sometimes God can only get our attention by waking us up at 3 a.m. And so Nicodemus seeks Jesus out in the middle of the night. And when he arrived, he found Jesus awake and waiting for him. Because God always is waiting for us. Always is awake when we call. So when you hear what I'm going to say next, please know that I love this story and I love Nicodemus, this man who loves scripture and prayer and God and God's people, this man who allowed the Holy Spirit to pull him out of his bed in the dead of night and who sought Jesus out. I love him. I don't judge him. Honestly, I think I probably am him for good and ill. But notice how he begins, how he approaches Jesus. He says, rabbi, which means teacher, and this is fine. Who has a category for Jesus at this point? It's actually remarkable that Nicodemus calls Jesus rabbi because Jesus doesn't have any of the institutional training or credentials that Nicodemus himself has, and Nicodemus addresses him as an honored peer. So it's not the rabbi that's a problem. It's what comes next. Rabbi, Nicodemus says, and then it's those next two words. Rabbi. We know. How typical, how extraordinary, how tragic that a mature, committed believer, a person of faith begins this and probably every conversation from this posture. We know. This sacred encounter begins not with a question, but with an answer. Because for Nicodemus, like many of us, that's how we move through life. We begin each approach with an answer. I'm going to like you. I'm not going to like you. I can do this. I can't do that. This is dumb. This is awesome. We start from our certainty, from what we, sh- we are sure we know, even and especially when it comes to God. How often do we come to God with our answers God, I know who you are. God, I know what you're doing. God, I know what you will give me. God, I know you will handle this problem. It's all different ways of saying, God, I know what you are doing. And we approach God and life itself in this way because, and here's a tragic irony alert, because we've been taught that this is the way to faith. The church, and in Nicodemus's case, the synagogue and the temple, our faith institutions, they teach us to be people who have answers, to be people who know the truth, to be people who have certainty. And it's so seductive to us, these answers, this certainty, because answers give us control and answers leave us unchanged. The church has taught us to be people with answers when it should have taught us to be people with questions. Because questions crack open our dried hearts to receive the living water of the Holy Spirit. Now, in my undergraduate degree, I was trained as an opera singer and as a scientist. Uh, And it's such a gift, not the opera singing (laughs) 
but the science. It was such a gift that when I was in college, I did not study religion. I studied science because religion classes teach you to have answers. And science classes teach you to have questions. And Nicodemus, for good and ill, he has been formed by his faith. And so he comes to Jesus with his answers. Rabbi, we know you're a man from God because of the signs you do. And he comes with his answer because he wants confirmation and affirmation from Jesus. He wants praise and a cookie. He wants to be blessed and to be told that the life he has is pleasing to God. But Jesus wants for Nicodemus what he wants for all of us, what Jesus wants for the whole beloved, blessed world. Jesus wants for Nicodemus to enter into the fullness of life in the kingdom of heaven here and now. So Jesus responds in a way that confuses the scholars. They say, like, why does Jesus just ignore what Nicodemus says? Why does he ignore the social conventions? Like, Nicodemus has praised and complimented Jesus, and when someone compliments you, you're supposed to do what? Compliment them back. So, like, why does Jesus ignore what Nicodemus says and just go off on a wild tangent? But I don't think that's what's happening. Jesus is responding to Nicodemus with the answer to the question that Nicodemus should have asked, that Nicodemus needed to ask. You know that Jesus is the one who is sent from God. So, you come to him and say, Who are you? What are you doing? What are you? Can I be a part of whatever it is you are bringing into the world? But Nicodemus doesn't ask any of those questions. Why? Because he is too satisfied by his faith. He is too conformed and committed to what he already knows and thinks. And Jesus meets him right where he is and loves him loves him and gives him the answer to the question that he didn't even ask. You can't enter into my kingdom, Nicodemus, until you are born from above. Now here's the nerdy Bible part where I tell you that the word Jesus uses can mean born again or born from above. And I love Nicodemus's response to what's next because it is just so human. So the idea of being born again, made new, born of new water, new spirit, all the things that Jesus goes on to expand, it's not original. One God, one story, one love, one scripture. In the Hebrew Bible, in the Old Testament, God is always talking to God's people about how God wants to make them new from above. So in Isaiah chapter 32, the prophet says, till the spirit is poured out on us from on high, and then the desert becomes a fertile field, and the fertile field seems like a forest, and the Lord's justice will dwell in the desert, and his righteousness will live in the fertile field, and the fruit of that righteousness will be peace. Its effect will be quietness and confidence forever. My people will live in peaceful dwelling places, in secure homes, in undisturbed places of rest. In other words, the spirit is poured out, the people are made new, and shalom is restored. In Joel chapter 2, 28, what does the prophet say? And afterward, after that great day, I will pour out my spirit on all people, and your sons and daughters will prophesy, and your old men will dream dreams, and your young men will see visions. They're made new. In Ezekiel chapter 36, verses 25 and 27, God says through the prophet, I will sprinkle clean water on you and you will be clean. I will cleanse you from all your impurities and from all your idols. I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit in you. I will remove from you your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit in you and move you to follow my decrees and keep my laws. So in other words, Everything that Jesus is saying in this whole encounter with Nicodemus is totally Hebrew Bible 101. This is absolutely essential foundational Hebrew theology. The idea that God will pour out the Holy Spirit, living water from above, and completely remake and transform and rebirth God's people. This is a theme in scripture. I could have cited a hundred more verses. Everyone in Nicodemus's day was waiting for the one sent from God who would bring God's spirit and power to bring spiritual rebirth to the people. And Nicodemus is a rabbi. He's a Pharisee. He's a member of the Sanhedrin. That means he literally had the Hebrew Bible memorized. So nothing that Jesus is saying is new to him. So when Jesus says you have to be born from above, 
Nicodemus's response is astonishing, not in a good way. He deliberately misunderstands Jesus and says, you ought to be born again. And then he mocks the idea, sarcastically asking, how can a grown person be born again when they're old? Is a grown man supposed to crawl back into his mother's womb? Which, ew. (laughs) But I want you to see that Nicodemus is making fun of Jesus for saying that God is going to do the thing that God has consistently said that God is going to do. For some reason, this it, he's mocking Jesus, and he's mocking Jesus for the same reason that anybody mocks anybody, because he's threatened and confused. So why? Why is the idea that God is going to keep God's promise threatening to want a person who's a leader of God's people. Why is the idea that God's people will be made new by the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, which is Judaism 101? Why does it make Nicodemus so worked up? Why is the teacher of Israel offended at the idea that God is going to be faithful? Because Nicodemus thought that new birth, being born again, born from above, being made new, reform, he thought it was for other people not for him. He thought it was other people who needed to be made new because he was already exactly who and what he needed to be. And the idea that God would want and need to make him new also deeply offended him. Why? Because of his faith. Nicodemus was a man of faith. He was committed to scripture. He was obedient to the covenant. He was disciplined in prayer and worship. He made sacrifices literally and figuratively to be righteous. He had mastered all of the responsibilities and privileges that came with his identity. He accepted it all. And he came to Jesus in the middle of the night to be affirmed, to be told that he was righteous and he just needed to patiently wait on everyone else to catch up to him. Like many of us, Nicodemus does not believe in the concept of rebirth. He certainly doesn't desire it for himself because he doesn't think he needs it. And he doesn't even believe in new birth for other people. Because like many of us, especially us religious people, it's easy for us to be like, oh, people are who they are. They are who they are born to be. They are not going to change. Nicodemus is not a villain. He's not a bad guy but he has been seduced by the enemy of our souls into becoming overly confident in what he knows and satisfied in his relationship to his faith community, his faith-based knowledge. He's enslaved by his certainty. His theology has become his spiritual armor. He knows God so well. He is such an expert that he is almost entirely closed off to holy revelation. He has faith in his faith instead of faith in his God almost closed off, except he isn't, because here he is, standing in front of Jesus in the middle of the blessed night. Here he is, living out another one of our guiding principles. Here he is, practicing healthy spiritual discomfort. He's offended, he's confused, he's being real, and he is listening. And Jesus is telling him he doesn't know everything And he doesn't even know what he thinks he knows. That God is making everyone new so that they can enter into God's kingdom, even and especially the experts and the authorities. Jesus is unapologetically confirming to Nicodemus that God is being God all by herself. Even without Nicodemus and the Sanhedrin's and the authorities' permission or understanding. And that is good news for those of us who wake up at 3 a.m. haunted by our fears and our doubts and our unbelief. It is good news to remember that we are loved by a God who is greater than our understanding or ability to comprehend. What a comfort it is to remember and rejoice in the truth that we worship a God who is beyond our understanding. And when we don't understand how God could possibly make all things well, when we don't understand how a no could possibly be faithful, we can have faith in a God who is beyond our ability to understand. I am grateful every time I run into Nicodemus because he reminds me to ask myself the question, am I done growing? Have I arrived? We went through a transformation process here at the Grove. We're still going through a transformation process, but about 
15 years ago. And, and I was in my mid thirties at the time I'd been a pastor for 10 years. And all of a sudden I was discovering all of these limits, all of these holes, all of these gaps in my ability and my understanding and my faith. And honestly, at first I was just embarrassed. I was humiliated. I did a lot of self berating. Like, how can I not know this? I should know this already. And there are times they are rare and they are so precious when I hear the spirit speak to me directly internally. And I heard the spirit say, well, would you rather already know everything you're ever going to know right now? Would you rather never learn another spiritual thing, never grow another spiritual inch? You can feel stupid that you don't already know, or you can feel grateful that God is still growing you and making you new. Whoever you are, however you come, the astonishing thing is God is making you new. That's not a threat. It's not a trap. It's not a test. It's a promise. You must be born from above. That's not a task to be accomplished. It's not a spiritual degree to be earned. It's a gift that God graciously and uniquely gives to each one of us in God's own perfect time. And that's why we paired this story with the promise from first Peter. We give thanks to God for his great merciful love for us, which has given us new birth and living hope in the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. What that means is in a way that is beyond our temporal understanding, our new birth has already happened in the resurrection of Jesus, which leaves us free to trust God and graciously grow into it all the days of our lives. We can be like the little children, confident that we are growing by the goodness and love and power of the Holy Spirit into exactly the people that God is creating us to be. Here is the astonishing good thing to marvel and ponder and revel and rejoice in. God is making us new. God the source of it all is God. God is doing it. It's God's power, God's love, God's beauty. It's not a test, trap, or competition. You are not going to be voted off the island. This life is not self-help. You can't do this for yourself. You don't have to. God is making you new, pure grace. And you are welcome to lean in as the wonderful teacher Dallas Willard says, grace is opposed to earning, but not effort. So you can speak the Holy Spirit, seek the Holy Spirit to show you ways that you are resisting. You can ask God to show you how you can more fully participate in what God is doing in your life. Just to remember, light yoke, easy burden, no fear, unclench your soul. God is making, God's not a factory. Each one of us comes alive and experiences new birth uniquely. Saul seemed like he became Paul in an instant. Nicodemus appears to have a slower, more ambiguous growth curve. Just remember that spiritual growth is like other people's marriages. You might think you know, you don't know. God is making us, all of us. So God is making you new. God is making your enemy new. God is making the stranger new. And here's the hard part. God is making the people that you are most intimate with. God is making them new too. I said it before. We have got to learn to trust the Holy Spirit with other people's souls. Let the people around you grow and change. Yeah. Sometimes we are so committed to who someone used to be. We are so determined to believe that someone is who we want them to be instead of who they actually are. Celebrate, encourage, notice, don't mock growth. Yes. There is nothing more discouraging yes. than being punished for the behavior that you have been taught, yeah. that you've been asked to display. Like when a kid comes when you call them and you say, oh, so you decided to come on time for once. Oh, you didn't interrupt this time. Oh, well, you know, you're always so dramatic. The world says people are who they are and ever will be. Perhaps people are just who they are born to be. Anybody who is worth anything already is that and is already known and celebrated for it. But we know that God is making all of us new. And I'm just going to tell you a story 
I was not the nicest kid. <laughs> I didn't really know how to be a friend. I was pretty bossy. I had a hard time. And I got a reputation for not being the nicest kid, being bossy, having a hard time. And then I really met the Lord. I went on a chrysalis retreat. I had this amazing transformative experience. And I started working really hard to be different as a teenager. And it was really hard because people kept seeing who I used to be instead of who I was trying to be. But I will remember till the day I die, this one woman, Nicole, who I met at camp and I'd known, she was a counselor and I'd known her for years. And one day she was monitoring a sailing test that I was doing. And she said to me, you know, Kate, you have really changed and I've noticed, and I just want you to know that I'm proud of you. And it meant everything to me. We have to celebrate what God is doing in one another's lives. We have to be able to love people before they're perfect because they're never going to be perfect. God is making us new. It's a collective as well, not just individuals, but God is making our faith communities new. This whole passage is about how it's impossible to enter into the kingdom of God without being born again by God's spirit. God's spirit requires us to have new birth. That is a consistent image in scripture, essential to identity in Christ's kingdom is being born again by God. And yet still for centuries, the church insists on using exclusively male language for God. We got to be born again by God, but God's a father, not a mother. God the Father is giving us new birth. Please, why will we not let the Holy Spirit make us new and make our communities new? I'll tell you why. Because the culture around us is patriarchal. It's exclusive androcentric language. And the church wanted to fit in to the way things already were. So it muted, erased the newness of the revelation that we had in Jesus Christ. And it denied the femininity of God, which is all over scripture. The local, I was at a local church recently. I'm not going to name it. This is pre-COVID. I was there for a digital ministry conference and it was a really good conference, but I will never forget one thing that the pastor said. He said, I recommend that you do what we do. We tailor all of our online presence to appeal to a 35 year old man. He didn't say white, but white. <laughs> So every announcement we make, every graphic we put out, every invitation, we design it to appeal to a 35-year-old white man. Why? Because if we can get the 35-year-old white man, he'll bring everybody else along with him. But if we center anybody else, we might lose that 35-year-old white man. Now that is a practical strategy. It's an effective strategy. But it is not new. And it doesn't create a new kind of community where everyone's humanity is seen and celebrated and lifted up. It is possible, like Nicodemus, to win at theology and win at your institution and lose the kingdom because you won't trust God to make you new. But friends, you can trust God to make you new. And you see it right here in this story because Nicodemus, his first words in the story are, Rabbi, we know. He begins with an answer, but he ends in exactly the right place. He ends with a beautiful, holy question. How can these things be? And the answer is God. The answer is the Holy Spirit. The answer is the resurrection of Jesus Christ, which is making all things new. The beloved, the astonishing truth is God is making us new. We can relax, we can rejoice, and we can celebrate.